Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to you wherever you are around this soccer world of ours. I'm Alex Fidrashevsky. Welcome to Corner Kick USA, the Corner Kick. It's Corner Kick Daily. Time for our look into the soccer world of ours and get right down to it. Let's begin domestically here in the United States. It's important to note the biggest development of the last few days, reports and the rumors floating about out of Major League Soccer's offices and out of Columbus, Ohio, that the Columbus crew may have a path to remaining at home where they belong in Ohio. It appears as if the ownership group of the Cleveland Browns poised to step in here and acquire the branding and the rights uh, and the ownership of the Columbus Crew franchise to keep the team in Columbus. And it also at the same time allows Anthony Precourt and his PSV, uh, whom I and almost everyone independent and quote in the circle of U.S. soccer media has been highly critical of throughout this entire frickin' process to move forward with his and their dreams and plans to acquire their desired franchise location for a Major League Soccer team in Austin, Texas. Most involved parties have released statements through MLSsoccer.com Want to delve into that a little bit. The MLS statement on Columbus here, quote, Major League Soccer and the Columbus Partnership have been working together for several months on a plan to keep Crew SC in Columbus, and we've made significant progress. Recently, the Haslam family, along with the Columbus-based Edwards family, have joined the effort to keep Crew SC in Columbus. MLS, the Columbus Partnership, and the Investor Group all agree that for the club to be successful in Columbus, it requires strong local partners, long-term corporate support, a strong season ticket base, and long-term plans for a stadium, practice facilities, and associated sites. MLS is committed to keeping Crew SC in Columbus should we continue to make progress on these critical components and agree to key terms with the Investor Group. MLS recognizes the cooperation of pre-court sport ventures and has demonstrated throughout the process to date. MLS also remains very committed to PSV's plan to launch an MLS club in Austin and is excited for Austin becoming a great addition to MLS and on and on and on they went. Um, so therefore, what it says, uh, they are working to get this done in Columbus while also moving pre-court sports ventures forward, as I had said in Austin, they went on to release, quote, regardless of any scenario in Columbus, there is a clear path forward for PSV to operate Austin FC as a major league soccer club. The strong support from Austin's corporate community, government officials, and passionate soccer fans is impressive. Austin is a flourishing, dynamic city that presents a great opportunity for MLS. And again, on and on and on, uh, states that they are looking to begin play no later than 2021 at a new privately financed stadium and soccer park at McCall Place. They apply the Austin community and so on and so forth. So it looks like MLS is finding its footing. There are a few more statements that were released with some uh, quotes that were on MLSsoccer.com, including a joint statement from the Columbus Partnership, Pete Edwards Jr. and Dean and Jimmy Haslam about forming an alliance uh, to keep the crew in, uh, in the city of Columbus, Alex uh, Fisher, the president and CEO of the Columbus Partnership, also put one out. And a lot of it was just kind of hand-holding and saying that we're happy and that, you know, Don Garber has gotten involved and, and all of that. Uh, and even, uh, you know, uh, the, the Haslams did it through the Cleveland Browns Twitter uh, feed to release part of their statement. And again, uh, your standard thing, but uh, they, again, the quote, we value and appreciate the benefits of professional sports franchise can bring to a community. Hopefully be part of the solution to keep the crew in Columbus. We would invest in strong infrastructure within the crew organization. So we continue our focus and commitment to building a winning Cleveland Browns football team in Northeast Ohio. We look forward to seeing how this process evolves. I think it's great from uh, all standpoints here that this is something in the works. We'll see if it gets across the line. And as I said now, it's clear that while it's not a done deal, there is a very clear path for the Columbus crew to remain in Ohio. There's a solid ownership group that seems to be coming together and sounds committed to the future of the franchise in Columbus. And that has to be at least at this point, a victory for local supporters. It's an important moment that even if just for now, maybe MLS has kicked the, quote, let's move a franchise can down a road and have come up with a unique and dynamic and maybe in some ways fortunate solution to keep one of the originals where they belong in their city. Uh, you know, sports teams being moved around, I think, is something that should be of the past. MLS is already less than favorite for a lot of American fans, especially everybody in that pro-rel movement. 
And ripping Columbus away wasn't going to make them any more warm to the league or the Federation or things like that. Now, I highly doubt most people involved care at all what pro rel twitter thinks but keeping the franchise in columbus is a positive thing as most mainstream and kind of mainstream supportive soccer media guys like jj and myself seem to believe that this is a positive thing we'll follow it closely as it continues to evolve and continues to develop because i think we're not across the line yet as far as the columbus crew remaining in uh, Columbus, where they have been since the inception of MLS, but we're darn close. Uh, it went from an impossible, um, done deal where it seemed that the team was on its way to Texas. Uh, it was just about a year ago. It was, I believe, October 17th of 2017. Anthony Precourt announced that he was looking to move the crew to Austin, Texas, and it it looks like he's still going to get his wish. He's got a team that's going to go to Austin, Texas, but it's not going to necessarily be the Columbus crew, or the question is, is this crew going to move? Time will tell. Is it Are, are, are the 23, 25, 28 guys in the crew, their coaches, etc., are they going to Austin, or if this group that comes to Ohio here to uh, Columbus out of Cleveland and whatnot, are they keeping the players here, paying some type of fee that then pre-court goes and gets players? Maybe his new Austin team gets a little extra Garber bucks, whatever you want to call them. Gam, tam, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. They get a little bit of the extra cash or something along those lines to build a roster. We'll have to see how that plays out it sounds like from what is being discussed uh columbus will pay an expansion fee this new group um but the players the staff and everything else will still be in columbus it sounds like that's the way that this is gonna be but this is again this is about 48 hours of a hand grenade throwing in all kinds of insanity into this, into Columbus. And we want to follow this. I want to try to see how that type of confirmation will come out probably over the course of the next few weeks if this does continue to progress in the vein that it has thus far where the Columbus crew are going to remain in Columbus. The next question is, again, is is Will Trapp going to stay in Columbus with this new crew ownership group or is Will Trapp going to possibly be the captain of Austin FC in a couple of years? Time will tell. Uh, that's it traps even around but again time will tell uh here for the columbus crew but definitely some really good things going on there in columbus ohio now looking ahead to the national teams uh the united states will be tackling peru lost to columbia it was exciting to watch sure you know there were some glimpses of brilliance that run by acosta uh on his goal for one and i've been pretty critical of him kind of hanging around mls as a young prospect or being in colorado how far is he going to push on uh, but that was nice from him, but there were some ugly spots like Michael Bradley jogging. So it's not just to take corners now with the World Cup on the line. It's to not chase Val Cowan friendlies either. Uh, anyway, the U.S. youth movement should be on. Probably should be it for Bradley with the national team. Very clear he's uninterested in being there any longer. Kind of unmotivated. It's best uh, for the U.S. to move on and kind of jettison this group uh, around my age in the uh, you know late 20s early 30s that just didn't get the job done for one reason or another uh, maybe they lacked a little bit of the bite of the generations before us a uh, little uh, designated player syndrome getting a lot of money in mls didn't really feel the need to push on as hard or just weren't as talented i think we'll just leave it at that let's move on to some other topics that people probably won't give as much press to because if you want to listen to the u.s national team ramblings you can go to ESPN FC, you can go to SiriusXM, go to MLSsoccer.com. There's plenty of places where you could get that from. What I try to do here is I want to take the program and guess, especially when we have JJ or a guest, we're going to touch on some of the main points. But when I'm doing my solo show, let's talk to you a little bit about some other things in the soccer world. I want to try to expand my horizons and everyone else's horizons a little bit and maybe drum up a little bit different type of conversation because it would be really easy for me to simply just go through the talking points of Major League Soccer, USL, some of the national team stuff, talk about the Nations League, 
league. And quite honestly, you can, I said, uh, you know, go to a 50 different places to get that. And honestly, you can get that from people who are at a higher level. Ray Hudson, Charlie Stilitano, you know, your grumpy pundits type guys, even a Jason Davis who, um, you know, is out there, you know, pretty regularly on the, on the daily. He's going to talk about the major things. I want to talk about some of the things that are a little bit uh, maybe or uh, more off the path a little bit. Uh, the Canadian national team, they'll be taking on Dominica, CONCACAF Champions League matchup, BMO Field in Toronto tomorrow the 16th. Uh, Le Rouge coming to the table loaded with attacking power as they look to take apart the minnows from the Caribbean. Um, there's not much to be desired in terms of absentees from this Canadian squad. It's pretty much as expected. You got Kyle Aaron, St. Ricketts, Lucas Cavallini, and uh, an intriguing 18-year-old at Ghent, Jonathan David, uh, up top, middle of the park. Same thing. It's packed. They even brought Atiba Hutchinson in for this one. Sure, maybe he's nearing his farewell with the Canadian national team, but the massive experience that he's got, it's only going to help young players like Balu Tabla, who obviously uh, recently made big waves by committing to Canada over Ivory Coast. Uh, and he's over there at Barcelona, Vancouver Whitecaps, stud Alfonso Davies. He's heading over to Germany in short order. Hey, you know, tossing Junior Hoylet, Scott Arfield as veteran leaders, and then the MLS guys, Piet, Osorio, Russell Tybert. Uh, Jay Chapman's a relative newcomer to the scene, 24 years old, Toronto FC. You can see uh, Canada taking this CONCACAF thing pretty seriously. Even in the back, it's a short bunch, but it's pretty talented. David Edgar, Daniel Henry. Uh, man, Raker James carved out one wild European adventure for himself thus far as a career. Ashton Morgan, uh, and then some prospects rounding it out. Derek Cornelius, Yavori Vanitsa in Serbia, and Zachary Brawl-Giard. He's a bright 19-year-old on the books over there at Lyon. Looks like uh, Simon Thomas probably in net, playing his trade in Norway's lower leagues uh, to get the, uh, the, the, nod, the nod, I should say, ahead of, of James Pantami from Montreal, and 18-year-old Alessandro Busti. Uh, who happens to be with those guys from Turin, that Ronaldo dude, whatever his name is, he plays for them. Uh, yeah, at Juventus. So some some hope there for Canada in goal with some of these younger players as well. The only major absences, I think, you know, starting goalkeeper Milan Bori on Red Star Belgrade. Do you, do you need to call him in to play Dominica? Probably not. Dejan Jakovic, 33 years old, LAFC. Marcel de Jong, Vancouver, 31 years old. They going to be around for the next cycle? You don't know. I have to try to start preparing. And and there's a pool of other talent that the Canadians have. Uh, and Michael Petrasso, Sam Atacubi, Marcus Godinho, Mark Anthony Kay. I can name a few others. Uh, Edwards, uh, Chris Twardick, even Atesha Wackendale still in the mix. All could be competing for spots at some point. And uh, even that uh, new recruit they brought in last time around, David Watherspoon from St. Johnstown. Uh, there's a little bit to talk about for Canada, and they should handle this probably pretty easily. Dominica has the population of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And it, obviously nowhere near the talent of Canada. I don't even know if their national team could compete in NPSL's Keystone Conference and win it uh, against Motown and FC Monmouth and some of them, much less beat Canada. Uh, I think you should expect Le Rouge to handle this one pretty bigly. Um, now, before we move on, I want to circle back to Boosty. As I said, he's 18 years old, born in Ontario, raised in the Turin area in Italy. He's been an Italian his whole life. But Herdman's team, to their credit, they found him, and it's part of maybe a little bit of this new Canadian soccer identity. Octavio Zambrano started to push this, the idea that guys were Canadian eligible would commit to play for Canada if the Canadian Federation simply asked them to do so. I think Scott Arfield is a prime example of a game-changing guy who came on board, and and Balu is another one. And you think about Boosty, sure, he didn't grow up in Canada, but his family apparently used to sing O Canada to him as a boy. And even in Italy, and, and they said that in spite of him living there and being firmly Italian in his culture, he had this bit of feeling Canadian about him, and that when Canada came calling, it was a no-brainer for him. And Maybe a little bit of that went into the fact that he's probably not going to beat out Donnarumma for the Italian job ever playing into it. You don't know, but Mauro Biello apparently led the pitch as the Italian-speaking uh, Quebecois guy from there in Montreal gave the old uh, Little Italy one-two uh, and landed boosty for the Canadians. Um, and apparently Herdman's crew has been scouring internet databases to find these hyphenated Canadians and bring them home. And it's a blueprint for some other similar countries that maybe Australia and New Zealand. And yes, even with all the big developments that we've got, the United States. Could a hyphenated Kiwi or two in the middle of the park have swung that pendulum for New Zealand against Peru? Or 
what if what if Australia had been able to land Avram Papadopoulos over Greece and had him installed at center back for them during um you know, during the, the their run through the World Cup, uh, you think about that. What, was would that have been a game changer? Maybe not necess- not in a huge manner, but it, it would have certainly provided some depth. And what about the United States? What if Giuseppe Rossi, or what if Nevin Subotic, or even you know he spent time here in high school? Maybe he never completed the paperwork. I'm not sure. But what about Vidade Bisevic? What if they were playing for the United States during the last few cycles? Canada, maybe they got tired of it. When you look at the list of guys they've lost over the years, obviously most notably his own Hargraves, but more recently some bigger guns like Azmir Begovic uh, to Bosnia, Jonathan to Guzman to the Netherlands, Teal Bunbury to, Uri, to the United States. That was a bit of a head-scratcher, I think, for everyone involved, given his father's stature in Canada, uh, that Teal Bunbury switched over to the United States, and it really didn't work out for him, whereas he'd probably be a regular for the Canadians. Uh, Alain Rochat was another one, born, I believe, in Richelieu, Quebec. Uh, equally perplexing when he went to Switzerland to play one match, you know, whereas he probably would have been a regular for the Canadian side his entire career. So is this a part of a, a, a change where Canada is stemming the tide? When you think about the guys who went elsewhere, how big of a difference could they have made? They've been hit hard by guys who went elsewhere and didn't crack through. And obviously, like I said, a Rochat, a Bunbury, they would have been regulars for Canada and others like Hargraves, de Guzman, Begovic. They could have been superstars for the Canadian national team. Now, some of these guys, they got World Cup appearances out of it, and you understand maybe why they did it. But what if they? a lot of these guys all stuck it together and played for Canada? Just some food for thought. Uh, let's move on a little bit further now here in our daily as we move along. Uh, where are we? Just probably about just past the halfway point. Uh, of the program. Uh, I spoke Friday about the firing, firing of Leonardo Jardim as Monaco's manager, and that made uh, French legend Thierry Henry Tabit to be his replacement. That was confirmed at the weekend. Henry has taken the offer, signed a three year deal good until 2021. Um, Henry began his career at Monaco, grew to stardom there before he moved to Juventus and catapulting to just a whole different stratosphere at Arsenal. Um, Henri had 28 goals in 141 matches, and most notably 7-9 in in European Continental matches in the 97-98 season while he was at Monaco. It will be his first test as a manager. And as I spoke about at the weekend, he's got to get this team together in short order. There are five losses from nine to start this season. They're near the bottom of Ligue 1. And while they've lost a bit of talent over the last two years, most notably, obviously, Bernardo Silva, Kylian Mbappe, there's still a boatload of national teamers in the squad, not just any national teamers or, or players. These are top-notch talents. Polish defender Kamil Glik, Russian midfielder Alexander Golovin, Montenegrin striker Stefan Jovetic, Radamel Falcao, Belgians, uh, there's two of them there that are very talented. Yuri Tielemann and Nasser Shadli and, and about a dozen others. If Henri can corral the horses here, he's the type of guy who can shoot them up the table in short order. And obviously the talent's there. And Are they going to make Europe this coming season? It'll be a damn tall order after the start they had. But if Henri can inspire this, this super talented bunch to get their act together, it's not impossible. Um, because the French League has a few big power clubs. Once you get to the middle of the pack, it's tighter. Bottom isn't that strong, so they can move up in short order if they can get it together. Also, as I mentioned, his hiring represents a bit of a trend right now where young retirees are being thrust into major coaching roles, and I dropped Stevie G and Frank Lampard among that group, but Henri still may face the biggest challenge. He's also stepping into the most talented side. Uh, Henri had gained interest from several other clubs, including Aston Villa. But Monaco had one power play in their pocket, um, and that was to play to his heart. Henri's key quote was, uh, and I quote, I was fortunate to receive him from very attractive offers over the last few months, but Monaco will always be close to my heart. Having started my football career with this great club, it seems like fate that I will now begin my managerial career here too. Uh, All the best to Henri as he begins his managerial career over there on the French coast 
in Monaco. In the same age realm here, via an ESPN FC report, former Italian national teamer Antonio Cassano has announced his retirement from football again for a second time. Just five days after he began to train with uh, lower league side Virtus Entella, Cassano trained with Verona over the summer and released a quote through a reporter, uh, Piero Luigi Pardo, saying, quote, over the last few days of training, I realize I no longer have the mentality to train consistently. Now the second half of my life begins. I am curious and fired up to prove, first of all, to myself that I can do things even without the help of my feet. Uh, Cassano went on to thank his friends and coaches, even people he disagreed with, and uh, finished up by saying, quote, football has given me so much. It allowed me to meet magnificent people, great champions, and common folk. Took me off the street, gave me a marvelous family, and above all, allowed me to have so much fun. Finishes his career with 141 goals, 109 assists in 514 matches. Uh, that's spread out across spells with multiple Italian powers. Even that will run out with Real Madrid in there. 10 goals in 39 matches for the Azzurri. And only once did Italy lose a match that he scored. An interesting fact. And that was the first one. 3-1 to one to Poland in a November 03 friendly in Warsaw. Uh, Cassano was masterful during the Euro 2012 qualification. He added six goals, including some big ones, most notably in a 2-1 win against Estonia and then against the Faroe Islands and Torshavn. These weren't big wins for Italy, but his goal was what was the difference in the match. So that's big uh, in that realm. He also bagged one against Ireland at Euro 2012. It was a 2-0 Azuri victory in the Polish port city of Gdańsk. So grazie, Antonio, as the curtain closes on what was an absolutely marvelous uh, career for club and country. I want to finish up by looking further into the Usain Bolt situation with Central Coast Mariners. ESPN FC columnist Stephanie Brantz was able to get a bit of a deeper look into this. The A-League season kicking off in just one week. Mariners CEO Sean Millicomp says that it is, quote, still too early to tell if Bolt's two goals against MacArthur Southwest and Australian ragtag semi-pro side on Friday was enough to put him over the top. There are some great quotes that came out of this. Uh, including tonight just puts more attention on a discussion we would have all we would already have had. It was always part of the program to have him play this game, and we'll keep talking the way we have been the whole time. We've generally treated Usain like we would any of any other trialist. He's been training hard with us, and tonight he showed weaknesses, but also showed his strengths and got to go got two goals. So all credit to him. Whether it sways the outcome, it's too early to tell. I think credit is due to both Bolt and Central Coast Mariners for seeing this whole thing out. Uh, he had a few runouts with some other sides, but CCM has been the closest to giving him a deal thus far. And regardless of if Bolt makes the A-League side or not, it's still a fantastic experience and exercise for all involved. And I think it's clear that Bolt has been nothing but professional and appreciative of all of the stops he's gotten. That This, this isn't some PR tour. That's obvious. The guy can play even just a little bit, and he may lack the repetition of motion to close the deal and win the contract, especially getting up there in age. But he's given it a serious effort, a serious approach, and I think maybe, sure, we should expect seriousness from an Olympian, but he could have easily laughed his way through the whole thing. But he decided to chase this professional footballing dream and gave, you know, 100% every time a club gave him an opportunity. That said, the A-League has hardline limitations on foreign players, and unlike the convoluted MLS rules that allow teams to consistently skirt those foreign player requirements via the green card system and all these other mechanisms. The Australian limit, the A-League limit, which I think is a positive thing, is that hard line. It's five foreigners, no ifs, ands, or buts, with very, very few exceptions. And Australia and New Zealand don't just hand out citizenship and green card opportunities like the U.S. seems to for pros overseas, nor should they. The idea is you want to develop your own. So this is where it gets harder for Bolt to break in. With those spots being so precious and four of the five spots already being filled by Central Coast Mariners, they've got Scottish striker Ross McCormick on loan from Aston Villa, Dutch midfielder uh, Tom Hyry, former Mali national teamer and Reading player Khalifa Cisse, and finally New Zealand uh, international midfielder Michael McGlinchey on the books as their foreigners. The question becomes, do they roll the dice of that fifth and final spot on Bolt, lock themselves in for the season with him? He's an inexperienced, never played pro soccer before guy who, I mean, at least he's not a sideshow, he's given 110%, but do they utilize that last spot on Bolt 
Or do they hold out until January, see how the season progresses, and then have the ability to grab an out-of-contract foreign talent who might be able to have a bigger and more immediate impact than Bolt on the field? Bolt might help him at the gate a little bit, but not necessarily help him on the field. And, And the guy they could bring in, the question mark player, bringing in a more polished resume, especially when you look at some of the other clubs in Australia, most notably Melbourne Victory, whose foreign five includes Japanese superstar Kasuke Honda, Swedish national team striker Ola Toivonen just star, uh, came in this summer, the both of them, along with an incredible wealth of riches of domestic talent that they have on that squad right now. It's being widely spoken about as the most incredible collection of talent in A-League history. I think the expectation is that they will win both the league and the playoff with the talent they've put together. You begin to see why Bolt may still, even if he's been impressive, be on the outside looking in with Central Coast Mariners. Want to do a bit of an A-League preview later this week, perhaps breaking down a couple of teams per day as we get closer to the first match day down under, Uh, but we'll get to that as time uh, gets closer. Again, maybe later in the week, maybe we'll look at that like Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and Friday. Just want to thank everyone for tuning in for today's version of Corner Kick Daily. Uh, Again, we're always uh, grateful for our promotional partners in our markets, and of course, we are always looking for new radio and television affiliates. If you have a radio station in your market that you would like to hear Corner Kick USA Weekly or Corner Kick Daily on, give us uh, a line here. Uh, drop us a line at uh, the Corner Kick USA Twitter or find me, Afid Rashevsky. I know that's a long one. Uh, shoot us a message in the, uh, the YouTube posting. However you want to reach out to us, make sure you like Corner Kick USA on Facebook. Uh, you can find us in multiple, multiple locations. Call your local radio stations as well. Tell them uh, that you want Corner Kick USA from White Eagle Marketing. Thank you uh, again for listening. We'll catch you here tomorrow. God bless uh, each and every one of you. Ciao for now.